In this video, we're going to be looking at time series forecasting and specifically at a method called moving average models. Now, time series forecasting uses past values to understand perhaps patterns or trends and to help predict the future. The important distinction between time series forecasting and regression is that in time series forecasting, there are no explanatory x variables. So for instance, if we look at the data uh, given, notice it says time period and then the number of Blu-rays sold within that time period. So our x values are simply the time periods. Now in regression, your x value would be something that helps explain the value that you're looking at. For instance, uh, let's say a real estate model. In regression, your x variable might be the square footage of the house. And we understand in some way that the size of a house would help to predict, say, the selling price of the house. But um, time series forecasting is when we really don't understand something well enough to have explanatory values. So we're simply looking at the pattern that evolves in the data over time. So let's, let's get started by just doing a, a simple um, graph or plot of this. So we'll select columns A and B there, the appropriate values. We'll do an insert. We'll come to the middle here where we have charts. And the chart that I favor would be this third one to the right, which says scatter with smooth lines. And so there I've, I've got a little uh, illustration of what is going on here. Um, it's labeled number of Blu-rays sold. So we see on the x-axis uh, we're going from 0 up to just shy of 25 periods. That would be the 1 to 24 here. And uh, of course we see that the number of Blu-rays sold corresponds to a low point of about 30 um, and you know, since it looks like there's nothing lower than 30, what I'd like to do is get rid of all this white space under there. It'll help make these various waves in our graph a little bit more pronounced and easier to decipher. So come over here on the y-axis and double click on any one of those numbers. Let's see, I had to do it twice um, there, and I have a window, or not a window, but a um, panel that drops down. Uh, make sure that you have this one that looks like a histogram selected. If not, click on that and you'll see here under axis options we've got minimum and max it goes from 0 to 45 and notice that corresponds to this range here in the graph from 0 to 45. So let's bump up from 0 and looks like we could safely have it start at 29. This graph never gets that low. So let's change the 0 to a 29. Uh, after typing in the 29, uh, simply hit enter on your keyboard. Okay, that, that's a little bit uh, nicer graph with all, all that empty white space underneath it. And we see a nice pronounced set of, uh, of movements in this, in this graph. Uh, lots of ups and downs. Now, the technique called moving average is actually very easy to accomplish in Excel. In column C, I'm first just going to title it, a moving average. Now when you average numbers, you remember um, you, you more or less add up the numbers you have and you divide by the number of data points. And what we're going to start out doing here is averaging two numbers at a time. Moving average n equals 2. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to be taking the first two numbers here in the data, the 33 and the 38, and we're going to be averaging them. And the idea is this. We're going to average 33 and 38 to get a prediction for the very next period. So in other words, what I want you to do is click on the third period down in the moving average column, type an equal, 
look for the average function. Type a few letters of the word average and just grab it from the list by double clicking on it. Now, this, this again corresponds to period 3. So period 3 will be formed by the average of the two periods preceding it. So the average of the 33 and the 38 here. And then click Enter. We've got a 36 there. Um, if we were to do this by hand just to see what we'd have, you'd, you'd discover that it was actually a, let's see, 60, 71, a 35.5. So let's go and click on that and let's add a decimal place. So go to home, numbers in the center, and the first one there, increase the decimal. So we can see a little more accuracy there. Now, once you have that, simply grab the corner there, the little dot there, copy it down. So we're getting a sequence of moving averages. We're averaging two at a time, but we're slowly moving our way down. So logically, here's what's happening. First, we averaged the 38, 33 and the 38 to get this number. Next, we would move one number down, and we'd average the 38 and the 31, and that would give us the element here in the next column. You know, then we would do the 31 and the 35, and the average of that would go one column down, one row down, one column over, and give us this value here. Okay, so moving average is kind of like a sliding average there. Okay, so the first two cells here are empty because we used the first two cells in row B to get the next um, row down here in cell C. Okay, let's do a graph of that. So select all three columns this time, all of our data there. And again, let's go and insert a chart, a smooth one. Okay, I'll move it here. And, you know, I'm going to go and, uh, again, so that we're not comparing apples to oranges, let's change this scale to also start at 29. So click on, left-click one of those numbers. Um, since I'm not on the histogram, I want to click on that. And let's see try access options and there you see what popped up automatically before so our minimum let's do it the same as the last time let's have our minimum be 29 okay so the first graph is the actual data of blu-ray sold this one here good idea to label these things so it's a moving average with n equals 2. Funny thing is when you uh, type in the chart title you don't see what you're typing till you click enter and then you'll see it. See I missed an e for average. So they're moving average n equals 2. Now here's what I'd like to point out about this graph in comparison to the original data. Do you notice that the yellow line for moving average equals 2 neither goes as low nor as high as the other one and furthermore the ups and downs are a little bit less pronounced. We say that moving averages smooth the data. All right? Data smoothing. We'll talk in a couple of minutes about why that might be useful but uh, let's just do another moving average or so just, just to practice the, the technique. So this time I'm going to do a moving average, and um, let's go. Let's make a big jump. Let's go up to say n equals eight. Now, since we're doing n equals eight, the first entry you should have in row D would correspond to time period nine. So time period nine, I come over, and it would be this cell. Okay, so the first eight should be empty because we're going to use 
eight uh, data elements to predict what happens in period nine. So equals average. Now don't accidentally go to column C. Go back to the original data, number of Blu-rays sold in column D. So we want to select the first eight of those. And then let's enter that. And as we'd expect, uh, you know, we're also getting decimals chopped off. You may not be sure how many are getting um, chopped off, so increase your decimal. Um, recommend you go out a few more places. We can always adjust this later if we need to, but let's copy down that formula. And yeah, three places actually help capture what's going on here. And so we have these data elements here. Now, you know, obviously uh, we've got a lot more empty spaces at the beginning. So when we graph this, the our new uh, predicted moving average isn't going to commence till we get quite a ways over here to the right. Let's see that. So we'll select them all. Again, insert our graph there. All right, I'll move it down here where I can see it. Oh, didn't want to move it that far. And again, let's uh, do a little work with these graphs so we can more easily compare them. We will again change the access values to commence at 29 rather than at 0. And furthermore, let's have this one just show n equals 8, and let's get rid of the n equals 2. So click, left click on your little funnel there. Oops. If you don't see this stuff here, click within your graph and it'll appear. So click on the funnel, and let's get rid of n equals 2 here. You have to apply it. Okay. Now, as I said, because we had to average the first 8, we won't actually have this commence till we get to period nine. Um, but ignoring that part of it, notice that this is smoother yet. You know, it's by no means a straight line, but it's eliminated a lot of these ups and downs that we see, or if not eliminating them, it at least is making them a little bit uh, less pronounced. Okay, so that's what a moving average does. It essentially um, summarizes the data by smoothing it. Now, how could these moving averages be used to make a prediction? Well, you could simply grab one of them, like let's say in column C, grab the very last moving average and bring it down a cell. So based on the moving average model, your value for period 25 would be 35.5. Now we may not get the same thing with n equals 8. Um, it, it differs a little bit there. So depending on the value of n that you select, obviously as I said, the larger the value of n, the more it smooths it out. The smaller, the less it will smooth it out. Now, you know, we might be wondering, um, why would why would you want to do this? Well, part of the answer is you won't always want to. It, it, it's not always the, the best technique. You see, um, there are some data where we truly might want to be following all those ups and downs. We might want to be tracking them very closely. There are other examples where tracking them closely could actually be very confusing. Uh, I'll be done with this video in a few minutes, and what I recommend you do is you click here in the green area. It has a very nice discussion, but just to kind of summarize uh, what it, what's going on, it's describing the case where rural areas were trying to track COVID cases. Now, in a very large metropolitan area, people could get 
tested seven days a week for COVID. But in smaller or rural areas, it could be that, for instance, most people went to a health department that may have actually been closed on a Sunday. So if the department was closed on, let's say, a Sunday or even an entire weekend, when it reopened on Monday, you'd be measuring not just one day's worth of uh, uh, cases, but perhaps two or three days worth of cases. So you could end up seeing a big jump on a Monday. You know, in the lots of businesses where that may be the case. But you're not really that interested in that, that big jump. It's almost a distraction. You're more interested just in seeing uh, sort of like more of a, a, a uh, less granular look at the data. Okay, so smoothing is great in cases where you don't want to be chasing every single up and down. On the other hand, um, something I'll be looking at in another video, a seasonal forecast, there are times where we don't want things to be too smooth. For instance, let's say that we sell something uh, that we uh, are more likely to sell in spring and summer rather than fall or winter. You know, a good example might be... Uh, swimsuits, you know, or water sports equipment. In that case, you know, we're actually very concerned in knowing that at certain seasons we have a high demand and others we don't. So we'll be looking at how to track seasonal data, which is exact opposite of smoothing. With seasonal data, you're, you're really interested in closely following those ups and downs. Okay, that's, uh, that's it for uh, this subject here.